Hello folks, this is Tom from anti-proton.com. I believe that I have found cesium-137 in my water and I've tested it several times now so I'm pretty sure that I have this correct. By the way, what you're looking at right now is the cesium-137 spectrum. This is not what I found in my water. If I found this in my water, I'd probably jump out a window. Anyhow, let me first stop and say that work has been pretty hectic for me. I'm a computer scientist. I get stuck working with people for uh, systems deployments, coding, all kinds of stuff that needs to get done. And I've recently been traveling all over the place. Those of you who are friends of mine probably actually know that I've been traveling all over the place. But for those of you, you who don't, I have been burning the midnight oil. Let's just say that would be the reason I haven't been replying to emails and such recently. I've, I haven't had time. Not, not one bit of time. So I apologize. Anyhow, let me show you what I found. And first let me state that I have said from the beginning that there is Fukushima fallout in rainwater and floating around in the air in general. Of course you can go back and look at all my videos and know that I've been saying this since probably just about day one. My argument has been that the levels that are out there are below the minimum detectable threshold for a Geiger counter, for just about any Geiger counter. And I have yet to see any scientific evidence by any credible scientist anywhere that in any way shape or form uh, disagrees with this. I've seen piles of studies that have shown that there's Fukushima fallout in your rainwater and some that suggest the levels that have, that, that have existed in several different um, places at several different times were probably in excess of what one might call safe levels. And of course one might also bring up the question of what what is a safe level of cesium-137. Personally I would prefer not to ever ingest any cesium-137 but I'll leave that up to the health physicists and doctors to determine what they consider safe or not. I strive for zero, personally. But regardless, uh, let me show you what I found and then why I think what I think, etc., etc. Now, this is a cesium-137 spectrum, and I want you to see this so that you'll understand what you're looking at later. All right, there's only a few things I need to show you that are kind of important. This part right here is the, is the peak caused by cesium-137. It's not actually cesium-137, it's something called barium-137M. Gamma rays, which is what my equipment detects, or uh, they don't actually come from decay, they come as a result of decay. Cesium-137 decays into barium-137M, which means metastable, and then it emits a gamma ray, which I detect right here, at 661.66. We'll call it 662 kilo electron volts, because that's about accurate. I think I had this thing cal calibrated at the time. That's all right, though. These guys right here are an interesting mathematical result of this peak right here. These, this is called a Compton uh, edge, and this is called a backscatter peak. They're not really important for trace contamination because you aren't going to see them in really low-level trace contamination. And this guy here is caused by the lead shielding of my detector, and you'll see that in every single spectrum I ever show. The only other thing that's important for cesium-137 is this. Let me see if I can select it. There we go. This is a peak caused by X-rays. These X-rays come from the cesium, uh, from the uh, barium-137. Again, cesium-137 decays to barium-137. As a result of it kind of calming down and relaxing into a kind of a more of a ground state, the electrons themselves have to relax, and they emit these little X-rays, which you pick up around 30 kiloelectron volts, give or take. So to make it simple, we'll call this peak right here 32 kiloelectron volts. And we'll call this peak right here 662 kiloelectron volts. That makes it simple. And all this other garbage you see around here, and these are the gamma rays that have bounced all over the place in my detector, x-rays that have shot out here and there, and other just kind of staticky stuff you get in the background. All right. Now let's look at the rainwater. Let's see. First off, here's my background. This is a background image, to give you an idea what my background looks like on my machine when there's nothing else around. 511, KF, 511 keV, the rest mass of an electron, I get a peak right here, and that's pretty normal. This peak is caused, as I just said, from a, it's a rest mass of an electron, basically it's high energy photons way, way, way far past this region right here that are bouncing off of stuff and causing something called para production, but it has very little to do with uh, detecting radioactivity from Fukushima or any other place. It's, well, it does, but it doesn't. So I won't go into it here. It'll take too long to explain. Anything you see right along here, this is usually where uranium and thorium show up. And because there's uranium and thorium on my walls, I have uranium samples in my house. I do occasionally get a little bit uh, picked up right here. And what I do is I run this background and then I subtract it 
from what I run for a, te a test sample, and that gives me the result I'm looking for. It kind of like removes the background. And these are low-level x-rays that I pick up right here. And I have to subtract them as well, too, so that I don't pick up anything bad. See, I have one right at 31 kiloelectron volts, and I get rid of that. This, of course, are x-rays from my detector. So now you, you kind of understand the principal players here. Let's switch to the rain sample. Okay, where is rain sample? Rain sample. Here it is. All right. Here's the rain sample I took a couple days ago. And what I did was I took a, I, I've taken fresh rain and, and run it millions of times. Well, probably dozens of times, maybe a hundred times. And I have yet to ever find any cesium-137 in it. But I thought to myself, what if I took one of my rain water collection buckets and, and the, it, it's had water filling up and then uh, dehyd uh, not dehydrating, uh, evaporating away, then filling up and evaporating away for months. Perhaps, perhaps some of the cesium hydroxide would stay. I don't know if the cesium hydroxide readily evaporates. As I've told you guys a million times, I like particles. I'm not a chemist. But as you can see right off the bat, click our mouse right here in the middle. I said click our mouse. Okay, right there. There's a peak right at 659 kilo electron volts. That's pretty close to 662, wouldn't you think? In fact, it's really close. 662 is right here. See? Right there. Let me zoom in. Okay, I just zoomed in. And as you can see, this is 662. And this is the peak right here. See? There's the peak. And there's 662. Pretty close. And I can be off a little bit in calibration because of uh, thermal drift, Doppler broadening, that sort of thing. All kinds of funny things. So when you expand this out and take a peek at it, you can see that there's kind of a peak right here. I mean, right on the dot. Now, one line by itself doesn't necessarily mean everything. But let me um, lower this a bit. It sort of stands out. And as you can see over here, when you click on this little guy, I said click. There we go. That's at 30 kiloelectron volts. That's pretty close to 32, which is right here. As I said, calibration can be off just a little tiny bit. So I have all the trappings of a cesium-137 detection here. A little tiny, minuscule one. Again, there's my para production. This right here is my um, lead shielding. That right there is probably from the uranium in my walls. All right. Actually, I take that back. This is what the this is no yeah. This has to be at the uranium in my, well, in my walls because I haven't removed my background yet. Here is a background removal. All right, where is background removal? There. With background removal, this is the same as this. But what I did was I, I removed that background that I showed you a minute ago. Basically, what's in my room. I'm sitting here where my detector is without anything else. And as you can see, the peaks are still there. You see twin peaks, not like the TV show. Twin peaks. And the entire area has a net count that is the total counts found minus the average counts found of 64. So it's definitely on the side of the plus. And again, there's an obvious peak sitting right here, the thin narrow one you get from the x-rays at 30.88. Of course, you're not going to get the kind of uh, results you'd get from a high purity germanium detector. That would be the best thing in the world. This would be an absolute dead-on confirmation if I had or, or not confirmation, it would be true or false. You'd obviously know from a high purity germanium detector. But as you can see, I can get a pretty good read off of a very small amount. And when you think about it, this is a very small amount. This is 142 total counts. 142 total counts over the course of 21,600 seconds. Let me see what that is mathematically. Okay, so let's take out our calculator and see this for sure. I had a total of... 142 counts, take the largest number here. All right, probably 64 is more accurate because that's the net counts. But let's take the whole thing and divide it over the course of 21,600 seconds. That's six hours, by the way. And we're getting 0 0.006 uh, uh, counts per second. That's, what is that, 10th, 100 thousandths? That's six one thousandths of a Becquerel. Not too much. Anyhow, um, I, I, my, my detector gets something like about 12% 
efficiency at this range. So just for giggles, I should probably sit down and do all the math exactly because, you know, results should be exact, not for giggles. But whatever, just while we're here on the thing, I'm going to divide this by 0 0.12 to get approximately somewhere near what the actual result is. And it's still somewhere around uh, five tenths of a back roll per 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 um, how much see how much water was this? I guess this was probably about a liter. So yeah, we're not really looking at too much here. We're way 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 less than a back roll per liter. And of course, my systems are well very sensitive, so they can actually detect that. So let's 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 say that I found one back roll per liter just for, for, for an explanation of sensitivity. Now I don't think I did. I think I found probably somewhere around five tenths of a back roll. But let's take a look and see. Here's some stuff for you. According to the according to SC International, which makes the inspector, which a lot of people use, it's like one of the best Geiger counters out there. Don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking the inspector. I own one myself. It's awesome. I'd show you their web page, but you know how copyrights work? I don't want to get yelled at or fussed at, so here's the link so you can just go look at it yourself. I mean, I'm not hiding anything. Look at it yourself, see if you see these numbers and whatnot. Um, here's a misspelled word that is now spelled correctly. According to them, they give their, their iodine, they, sorry, they give their sensitivity for their detector in, uh, with iodine 125, which I think is absolutely ludicrous. It's because it is an effective pure gamma emitter. It actually emits x-rays and, and gamma rays uh, through electron capture, which is kind of funny, but it acts like a pure gamma emitter. When they say that they can detect at contact, that means a point source, like a little speck of dust kind of point source, they can detect 0 0.02 micro curie, which is equal to exactly 740 becquerels. So they can detect 740 decays per second which is 44,400 decays per, se uh, per minute. That's the minimum they can detect at contact for iodine uh, 125. That means not diluted in water, which you'd require more, or in soil or anything like that, which you require, of course, again, more, because if, you, if you're inside of soil and water, you have to take into account the linear coefficient of soil and water, because basically the gamma rays get somewhat blocked and attenuated. So you actually need a significant amount to detect it with an, with an inspector or using the LND 7, 7317 tube that they use. And this is per them, not me, per them. Now, some of you might say, well, what if I ran a timed count? Let's say 10, 12 hours on a timed count. The reality is on a timed count on a, on a Geiger counter, you actually probably would gain a greater degree of detectability than this. But if you were to become 100 times more sensitive, 100 times more sensitive than you'd be looking at 74 decays per second required. The cesium I saw was less than one decay per second, by far. So if you were, um, oh sorry, that, that'd be 10 decays, I'm sorry, 100 times uh, better would be seven decays, that still doesn't work, you still wouldn't detect it. So you'd have to become a thousand times, well actually not a thousand, less than a thousand, somewhere between 100 and 1,000 times more sensitive, 700 and sometimes more sensitive it looks like, to have even the slightest chance of detecting what I got from water that I left for over a month, because I can't detect it at all when I don't run it for, when I don't leave the water for at least a month. So how could that possibly be responsible for hundreds of counts per minute in your water? Of course it's not, obviously. I mean. I could just simply point out the fact that there's no scientific evidence to, su to support this, but I like to actually prove things, not just say stuff, because, you know, you can just perpetuate lies if you just say stuff, and I want to try to, you know, back up what I'm saying, as opposed to just say, saying, you know, what I've read off a TV show or something, or, or, or a magazine. And here's iodine-125, it decays by electron uh, uh, capture, it produces gamma rays and x-rays, uh, mostly x-rays, by the way, too. That's the strongest x-ray that comes out of it. That's the strongest gamma ray, and they're both just photons. Uh, I got this information right here from the um, from a U.S. government site that contains just buku amounts of, uh, of, of data. By the way, you can't show it because it has copyright stuff all over it, so there's the link. And I'm just going to put this in the information because, honestly, who wants to actually write this down? Just get it from the information. Now let, let's explain something else from the SE International website. I wrote it down, so it's me writing it down. So 
And they say from 10 to the first KeV to 10 to the second KeV, and let's just do the math to make that easier. That's 10 kilo electron volts to 100 kilo electron volts. This is the strongest and most sensitive range for their Geiger counter. And that makes sense. Geiger counters love low energy gammas if they're going to pick a gamma up at all, because they actually love betas the most. They love low energy. Okay. Now, they don't like high energy so much. Oops. Zero. You can see I threw this together. 10 to the 3 is 1,000 for those who do math. Okay. As you can see, 10, uh, 10 times 2... Uh, sorry, 10 to the second is 100 keV, 10 to the third is 1000 keV, and, you, and at this point, if you look at their graph, and here's the graph by the way too, this is the link for it, you can just go look at it yourself, you can see that their ability to detect it with the, uh, with the inspector declines massively at this point, and unfortunately 662 keV, that's cesium-137, via barium-137M, shows up right within this range. They can still detect it for sure, I have cesium-137 samples myself and I can have an inspector and I can detect it just fine but the resolution the ability to pick it up the efficiency it declines at this point it declines from my from my gamma spectrometer too it just maintains still a massively higher ability to detect by the way here's the uh, site to go to to get all the isotope information if you ever want to look it up great place to go okay so what have we learned from all of this really please go and look at this I hate being one of those people that's like showing you stuff to go look at. I can't stand videos that do that. But then again, copyrights, if I put it on here, I get fussed at. So, you know, whatever. All right. So we're pretty sure that we're not detecting this. Uh, like, let me, let me show you the rainwater here. This is what rainwater looks like. As you can see, this bears a tremendous semblance to this. See? Look at all the players. They're all there. This is natural uranium. Here's bismuth 214, uh, bismuth 214, lead 214, lead 214, lead 214, radium, and some other stuff. And if you look, oops, if you look, I said if you look, let's, you know, chrome is weird. There. If you look, there's bismuth 214, lead 214, lead 214, lead 214. Not too much over here because what's here is radium-226 and radium-226 comes before radon because this is radon progeny that we're seeing and then if you give it about a month or so to relax and calm down so all this stuff here goes away this is what you're detecting with your Geiger counter then you end up with this there you go cesium-137 in my rain not enough to probably do a darn thing to me depending on your interpretation of whether any is, you know, safe or not, which of course I don't think it is. Radiation isn't necessarily safe, but I mean, I wouldn't, you know, jump out a window over this very, very trace amount. My systems are very sensitive. But I just don't understand how one could detect cesium-137 with the Geiger counter like this. Don't see how. Not at these ranges. Even if I... Even if I'm off by hundreds of, of, of times, thousands of times even, it still doesn't quite fall into the minimal thresholds required. So um, I'm sorry I've been away, and I'm going to continue to be away. I continue testing, and I'll be posting stuff. Uh, I have a busy busy schedule, busy deployment coming up with lots and lots of systems to go around the world, which I can't really go into. But this has been Tom, the overworked computer scientist. For manti-proton.com, remember, once again, folks, computer scientist does not mean physicist. I am not a physicist. I have no physicist training. I am not a physical scientist in any way, shape, or form. I'm terrible at chemistry, not so good at math. So just making sure you've got my declaimer. Oh, declaimer, yes, declaimer. Disclaimer. I also haven't had enough coffee, and this is all very impromptu. So uh, don't try this at home. Drink moxie soda. There you go. Bye-bye.